Hello, today's poem we're discussing is At an Inn by Thomas Hardy. Before we start, if you haven't yet subscribed to our channel, it would be greatly appreciated if you would. Thank you so much. I have the poem here, so let's start. When we as strangers sought their catering care, veiled smiles bespoke their thought of what we were. They warmed as they opined us more than friends that we had all resigned for love's dear ends. And that swift sympathy with living love which quicks the world may be the spheres above made them our ministers moved them to say ah god that bliss like theirs would flush our day and we were left alone as love's own pair yet never the love light shone between us there but that which chilled the breath of afternoon and palsied unto death the pain flies tune of afternoon and palsied unto death the pain flies tune the kiss their zeal foretold and now deemed come came not within his hold love lingered none why cast he on our port a bloom not ours why shaped us for his sport in after hours as we seemed we were not that day afar and now we seem not what we aching are. O severing sea and land, O laws of men, ere death once let us stand as we stood then. This poem about the trials and tribulations of love is something most readers will relate to. So there's plenty to unpack. Let's start. In the poem, the speaker, likely the poet, recounts a visit to an inn he made many years before with a female friend. There, the staff mistook them for lovers, although they were not, and the speaker says they felt no love at the time. However, many years later, the speaker says both love each other passionately, but now, all is too late because both are separated by distance and likely married to others. The speaker reflects on love's cruelty and irony. That love was not present when it should have been or could have been when they both had the potential to love and share a life together. The poet uses flashbacks to a time when the speaker, likely Thomas Hardy, and his friend Florence Henniker visited an inn many years earlier. In stanza one, when the couple arrives, the staff mistake them for lovers. Behind veiled, hidden smiles, they serve them and opined, believed, the couple looked more than friends. The pun describing their attempts to hide their smiles, veiled, suggests the wedding veil worn by brides, and it's possible they're being mistaken for newlyweds. But veiled may mean time, their love was hidden from themselves. The couple didn't realise at the time they loved each other. The pun ministers on line 13 continues the marriage theme. Minister can refer to staff ministering, attending to customers' needs, but ministers are also clergy who marry couples. The spheres above made them our ministers. To the servants, the staff, these newcomers don't just look like lovers, but are the perfect embodiment of idealised love, love's own pair. In stanza two, the staff are so moved by the couple's apparent joy that they wish God to grant them love as blissful, 
joyful as the love they embody. Through apostrophe, addressing something unliving or absent as if it were there, the staff asks God to grant the same bliss, joy, he has given the speaker and his companion to them. The veiled smiles may suggest the staff are worldly enough to know this is an illicit meeting. They have seen similar before. And discreetly reassure the couple they can relax without fear of disapproval. Ah God, that bliss like theirs would flush our day. Ironically, love's bliss was never present between the speaker and his companion while at the inn. The speaker's exclamation on line 20 of the poem highlights the irony of the situation. And we were left alone as love's own pair, yet never the love light shone between us there. Love is personified and the couple, his poster girl and boy as love's own pair. Stanza four is the poem's turning point. Will they kiss or not? They don't. The kiss their zeal foretold and now deemed come came not within his hold. In lines 26 and 27, a type of repetition is used. The polyptaton come and came the juxtaposition of the future come and the past came marks the crossroads of the couple's relationship. The kiss the speaker hoped would come never came. Consonance is used to capture the numbness of this non-event. A muffled M sound in deemed come and came suggests the potential for love was snuffed out and their meeting was an anti-climax. Looking back to the event, the speaker now realises the kiss would have led to a future in which they are together, but instead they are separated from the other. Rather than a kiss, the speaker recalls a chill between them. The poem contrasts the idealised love the others at the inn believed the speaker and his friend are feeling with the coldness each felt. The reality of the situation is at odds with the fantasy. There is a cold emotional distance between the speaker and his friend once they're left alone. Through hyperbole, exaggeration, the personified breath of the afternoon even makes a fly buzzing near a window sicken, palsied and die. But that which chilled the breath of afternoon and palsied unto death the pain flies tune. The kiss the inn staff predicted never came. The kiss their zeal foretold and now deemed come came not within his hold. Love lingered numb. Numb, a word we associate with being frozen, stresses the chill in their relationship. In lines 29 to 32, the speaker asks two rhetorical questions, both of which ponder the fickleness of love. Using personification, the speaker ponders why love would be so cruel as to cast the bloom, the glow of love on him and his friend to make others believe they were in love when there was no bloom in reality. Bloom is also a pun, comparing love to a flower that never bloomed, grew and flowered. In line 31, sport suggests people are the playthings of a cruel god who enjoys causing them ruin. Why shaped us for his sport in after hours? The rhetorical questions articulate the concerns of failed love that many readers will relate to. Oh, why did this have to happen to me? Why did it have to happen to us? We sometimes believe we are subjects of forces beyond our control. In the poem, the speaker believes he is the victim of a malicious god 
or fate, the spheres above. And this is something the reader can relate to in matters of love. Why me, we ask, when a relationship fails to spark and love fades for some inexplicable reason. Couples fall out of love as quickly as they fell in love. The spheres above refer to the planets and stars and the belief that their alignment determined people's destinies. The speaker's questions are unanswerable. That's the point. Flies are often symbolic of death and usually appear near decaying matter. The symbolism stresses there's no romance blossoming between the two. All this was the moment when the potential for romance died. These lines of the poem possibly allude to Shakespeare's King Lear, in which the Earl of Gloucester says, As flies to wanton boys we are to the gods, they kill us for their sport. Sport is such a specific word here, and combined with the mention of the fly in the line, makes this allusion plausible. Another intriguing feature is we never learn the purpose of the visit. For a man to be spending this kind of time alone with a woman who wasn't his wife would have been unusual under the strict moral codes of the Victorian era. Plenty of illicit behaviour still went on, and it seems the speaker and his companion seek the anonymity of the inn because it is a place where the arrival of strangers is a common occurrence. Perhaps they meet to spark love between them, only to leave in disappointment and regret. One or both may already be married, and this may be the reason for their anonymous liaison. The mention of after hours refers to the inn's closing time. It suggests the speaker and his friend are staying over. Hardy and Florence Henniker did stay at an inn together. After hours also refers to the late night activities of lovers. The phrase is ironic since the speaker and his friend did not get up to anything sexual. Another interpretation is that they did, but it failed to kickstart love or generate any warmth or feeling. Stanza 5 transports us from the inn to the present, where the speaker is writing the poem. He looks back on the day at the inn and confesses he now loves his friend, but he cannot be with her. As we seemed we were not that day afar, and now we seem not what we aching are. Ironically, there has been a complete about face in the relationship. To outsiders, they appear not in love, but are. And if the speaker is to believed, both are aching for each other. It's worth noting there is no evidence that Florence Henniker felt anything more than friendship towards Hardy. So it is reasonable to speculate whether this is no more than wishful thinking on the man's part. The negative emotive words, aching and severing, stress the pain the speaker is feeling. On line 36, placing the word are at the end strongly emphasises that each shares this pain. We aching are. If we take the speaker's account at face value, the couple may be keeping up appearances to avoid the risk of being caught in the act of adultery. Line 38 suggests the speaker and his friend are married to others. Autobiographically, Hardy and Henniker were married to others and divorce was socially unacceptable in the Victorian era. The laws of men, marriage laws, forbid their union but they are also separated by distance. O oh, severing sea and land. Being together is now impossible. They are separated by severing sea and land and the laws of men. In other words, physical distance and their marriage to other people prevent their union. 
apostrophe, addressing something unliving or absent, here the severing sea and land and the laws of men, stresses the speaker's wretched situation and his inability to overcome man and nature. These lines contrast starkly with the close physical proximity between the two at the inn when love misfired. In line 37, the sibilance of severing sea suggests a sinister, cruel hiss at nature and fate as though the speaker is spitting out these words. Anaphora, a form of repetition, for example, O severing sea and land, O laws of men, is melodramatic to emphasise the speaker's pain. Using melodrama heightens emotions. Ere death once let us stand as we stood then. The speaker begs for fate to transport them back to that moment at the inn when they seem destined to kiss. The use of polyptoton in stand and stood affirms that their moment to change destiny at the inn is lost forever. The assonance of love lingered contrasts with the shorter use of consonants in deemed come came not and numb, creating disorientation, as though the speaker's emotions churn when remembering the fateful moment. The poem is rich in irony. When the speaker and his friend looked like they were in love, they weren't. Yet now that they are in love, no one else sees it, or no one else is allowed to see it. The tragedy lies in the fact that when the speaker and his friend were physically together, right next to each other, alone in the same room, they weren't in love. And now they are in love, they can't be physically together. The poem presents love as something mysterious, painful and cruel. There is no resolution, only a lingering nostalgia and a wish for the impossible. The poem is broken into five eight-line stanzas, each featuring a steady meter and rhyme scheme. Based on the rhyme scheme, stanzas can be further broken down into pairs of quatrains. This form is relatively straightforward, perfect for telling a story and discussing the poem's important themes. The poem divides into past and present, the change occurring at stanza five. The poem uses the binary opposites of love as fantasy and love as reality, as well as past and present. Interestingly, the poem alternates between lines of iambic trimeter, three iambic feet within an unstressed, stressed syllable pattern per line, and iambic dimeter, two items per line line 17 and 18, shows this pattern at work. And we were left alone as love's own pair. Iams are used commonly in English poetry because they sound a lot like natural speech. However, the poem's metre features substitutions with the speaker swapping extra syllables or feet other than iams into lines and keeps things from feeling too strict or rigid. This is also aided by enjambment, run-on lines, which makes the story flow. Why shaped us for his sport in after hours? This metrical pattern is basically broken iambic pentameter with five items per line. Iambic pentameter is the typical meter of the sonnet and is associated with love poetry. Being echoed here in broken form, lines of three, then two items, may reflect the speaker's broken heart and the couple's separation. Each stanza uses the following rhyme scheme, A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, which creates a sense of momentum and perhaps the predictability that the past cannot be changed. The inn is an apt setting because they are places of transience. People on a journey stay there for
for short periods. The setting reflects the transience of love and life's journey and presents the couple's time together as a fleeting moment. Although the speaker is Thomas Hardy and his friend is likely Florence Henniker, it is unnecessary to know these biographical details to sense the regret within its lines or the themes of love and loss the poet addresses. Importantly, we hear only the man's account and it would be interesting to have the story recounted from the woman's point of view and whether she feels the same as him. It would be interesting to hear the story of the visit to the inn from the woman's perspective. The poem was published in 1898 in Thomas Hardy's debut poetry collection, Wessex Poems and Other Verses. By this time, Hardy was 58 years old and a famous novelist. These poems were collected over the decades, set against the semi-fictional backdrop of Wessex in the southwest of England. This poem is also interesting because unlike most poems, which look back to a time when a couple was in love and have since fallen out of love, it reverses the falling in love trope and subverts the typical love poem. Unlike a typical love story, the couple at the start do not love one another. They find themselves in love only years later and the speaker regrets they cannot be together. The poem is presumed to be autobiographical and one of at least two Hardy poems that refer to his relationship with Florence Henniker, a poet and novelist with aristocratic lineage. As the story goes, Hardy made amorous advances to Henniker and was swiftly rejected, not least because he was married at the time. On one occasion, they did meet at an inn in Winchester and were mistaken for man and wife. They did, however, strike up a friendship and wrote letters to each other for many years. Hardy's poem Broken Appointments also laments a missed romantic opportunity. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you found it interesting and useful. If you did, please hit the like button below. Also check out our other videos on textual analysis and writing. If you haven't yet subscribed to our channel, it would be greatly appreciated if you would. Thank you again. Until next time, from Carol and me, write well.